Um, I'm turning it over to Russ to learn all about herping in the Trans-Pecos region of Texas. Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Bronwyn. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm Russell Rosell. I've been living in Maryland since 2016. I spent, I was born and raised in Texas and I got into herbs as a little kid. I used to go to the library and read everything I could find on them, every book. Um, and I've lived in Washington, DC and I've also lived in New York City. Uh, but I got back into it here the last couple of years and I'm real passionate about it. Um, so I went back, I got an opportunity to leave last summer in the middle of COVID and go back to Texas. I had some, I, I got an early retirement from my company basically due to COVID. So first time in my life, I had all this time on my hands and I said, you know what, I, I'm gonna drive out there. And I went out there and uh, had like a tr the trip of my life, one of the trips of my life. It was just amazing. But I also do a lot of stuff here in, in Maryland. I do a lot of herping in Maryland. I have eight snakes of my own. Um, that I'm So I'm into the husbandry thing. I wrote one piece for the newsletter. Um, so anyway, without further uh, introduction, I'd like to get it started. I've taken a lot of time to put this together. I did a lot of research and I hope it's informative for everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can we all see that? Can everybody see that? Okay. Uh, let's do slideshow from the beginning. Okay, one of the reasons I wanted to go out there is because I wanted to go to Big Bend National Park um, out in the Trans-Pecos area. And right before I left and got on the road, somebody that either lives or works in the park got COVID. So they shut it down. <laughs> so number one rule in herping is, is be adaptive. Be ready to adapt. <laughs> so I wanted to go into the park, but this is as far as I got to the left of this shot. Um, is a big sign that says the park is closed until further notice due to COVID. Um, but anyway, you can kind of see some of the hills back there, what it looks like, what it looks like out there. It's fairly arid, semi-arid region. It's called, uh, most of it's called the Chihuahuan Desert. All right, and I wanted to talk about um, some of the different locations, popular herping locations in the United States, briefly. Um, Florida is obviously a paradise for anything herps. Um, Arizona, um, particularly the southeast part of the state, is, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Daniel could probably let us know a little more about this. He's from there. Um, so yeah, that's pretty accurate. I'm sorry? I was saying that's pretty accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Southern California, uh, there's a place in Southern Illinois that's called Snake Road. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's set aside protected land. The snakes and the herps are all protected. And there's a big cliff up on one side where they all brumate in the winter and a big swamp on the other side or a lowland on the other side and they migrate twice a year. So if you get there at the right time of year, you can just see all kinds of all kinds of animals, all kinds of uh, herbs crossing the road. Uh, the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, if you're a salamander person, and I believe frogs and tree frogs as well. And I think that extends down into North Carolina as well. The Smoky Mountains go across several states, but I've heard the best spots are in Tennessee. And then there's another place that's kind of mythical in our in our um, literature, and that's the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. I don't know how good that is anymore. I understand there's been a lot of development there. Um, but then there's Texas. So why why Texas, Russell? That's kind of a question I'm getting to here. Why would I go to Texas to go and and look for these animals and document, photograph them, whatever whatever your uh, interest is? So I put together this slide and it's a bit of a quandary because 
uh, the taxonomic changes with snakes and turtles and lizards and a lot of uh, amphibians, they're changing. They change all the time now. And basically, most of a lot of us, what they used to call subspecies, are being eliminated. And they're now, because of DNA and genetic uh, analysis they have now, they know that these animals aren't separate species. They're just, they just have different colorations in different regions, basically. That's my interpretation of it. So these numbers are variable. Um, I used a number of sources to try to get these numbers, but this is this is my best guess. There's 108 species of snakes in Texas. 15 of them are venomous. We have, I believe, 27 here in Maryland. I believe that's the right number. They have 33 species of turtles and tortoises, five are sea turtles, which are, I, I think, the same five we have here. Uh, there's 60 species of lizards, one species of crocodilian, obviously the American alligator in the southeast part of the state. There's 28 species of salamanders, 44 species of frogs and toads. Um, so they got a lot of species diversity. And a lot of people, going back to the next slide, a lot of people think of Texas and they think it's one big desert. And it's, it's a huge state, obviously. It's a very, very large state. It's 800 miles from the tip of the, tip of the south to, at Brownsville, Texas, up to the Panhandle. And it's 773 miles from El Paso out in the far western part of the state to Orange, Texas, right on the Louisiana border. So it's a big state. And there's a number of uh, there's a number of geographic regions, and these this kind of lays it out. You've got everything from Big Bend in the west, which is mostly what what this Transpecos presentation is about. There's the hill country in the center of the state. There's plains, Gulf Coast, piney woods, prairies and lakes, and then the Panhandle is a big open, flat plain for the most part. So there's all different um environments in the state it's not just one big desert or anything like that so this slide i want to thank daniel for this photo uh, it, it's technically a little disclaimer here this is not a horn lizard that can be found in the state of texas i don't remember the exact species but it was such a beautiful shot i had to use it um, and it looks pretty much the same as the Texas horn lizard. And the, the state reptile of Texas is the, the Texas horn lizard. And they were once very common. It's now on the threatened list due to habitat destruction, pesticides, and invasive fire ant populations. Now, I went, up until the time I was five, six years old, I lived in a little town in West Texas called Hondo. In our backyard, when I was like five years old, I remember catching. We called them horny toads. I remember catching these. That's probably the first herp I ever saw or ever caught. And we put them in. A, we put them in a shoe box and keep them in the room for a little while, and then go let them let them go. Me and my little brother. But um, from what I understand now, what I found out researching this presentation, that's not the case. You can't just find them in your backyard anymore. There, some places maybe, but they're um, they're struggling a bit. Uh, they're very specific in what they eat. They eat a particular type of ant. And these other ants that were invasive came in and wiped out the ants that is their primary, uh, their primary prey. And, um, and their, their numbers have dwindled. And, and there's other reasons for it. That's not the only reason for it. But I'll get, I'll get back to that a little bit later. All right, now this is always interesting. The laws regarding herping in every state are different. So whenever you go to another state and you want to go do this stuff, it's really important to go do the research and find out what you can and you can't do. And then looking around um, the different laws. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not encouraging anybody to do anything or not do anything here. I'm just simply trying to document what I ran into before I went out there with the stuff the the, the requirements to go do this in the state of Texas. And in Texas, you have to have a state hunting license. They classify them under game, but they call them non-game species. So you have to have a Texas state hunting license. And if you're going to pursue or to do anything with a non-game 
animal, which they are considered, you have to get, you have to purchase a permit for that. I think it was like twelve dollars. An out-of-state Texas hunting license is three hundred dollars or more. It's very expensive. Um, that that if you don't live there, if you live there, it's it's obviously less expensive. Um, so it is legal to hunt and or capture herps unless the species on, is on a list of protected species or resides on a wildlife preserve. They only have like one list they publish, uh, which includes threatened and endangered animals. We have three lists here. We have an ABC list and the restrictions vary depending on where the animals fall on that list here in Maryland. So this is where it gets a little contentious. <laughs> Um, in order to rose cruise for herps, um, this isn't contentious, but one must wear a re reflective vest when you're out at night on the roadways. However, it is illegal to capture or molest a herp while it is in the finished roadway. And that's quote, I, I put an asterisk here because there's a, there's a lot of, uh, if you talk to the people in Texas who do this, they you get, the, there's a lot of, uh, feelings about that. <laughs> And basically, from what I could gather, the law is that they don't want you collecting animals. The, the key word there is collecting animals off the roadway at night or in the day. And they also have laws against spotlighting an animal with any artificial light, whether that be a flashlight, a spotlight, or your headlights of your car. Which is kind of interesting, because if you're driving around at night with your headlights off, they're going to give you a ticket for that. So it's a bit... It's a bit ambiguous, but I, I think the intent is to keep people from using spotlights to find animals at night. Uh, I, think, I think that's the intent. Um, but the other, the other interesting thing is, is if the animal, it's the finished roadway. So if it's asphalt or on the shoulder of the road, if, if the animal is in the road, you can't touch it. You're not supposed to touch it or capture it or even photograph it really for that matter. Uh, but if it crawls off the roadway and there's a big section in Texas on the side of the road that's still public land, if it crawls off the roadway, it's kind of free game. It's, at least that's my interpretation. Or if it's up on one of these road cuts that they where they blast the road through the, the mountains and it's, the animals get up on these road cuts, that's kind of free game too. So it's a bit um, it's a bit ambiguous, I would say, because technically, if I pulled up and it's at night and I see a turtle in the road in Texas, and I stop and I see it with my headlights in my car, and I top, stop and I move it off the road, I technically violated the law. Now, I doubt any TDP, the Texas Department of Wildlife, is going to give you a ticket for that, but. It's technically illegal to move an animal off the road, even even if it's, um, you know, crossing the road. So anyway, it's also interesting. It's legal to keep venomous herps in Texas. All you, all you gotta do is pay a twenty dollar permit, as, as far as I could tell, and you can keep. If you want to keep a hundred rattlesnakes in your house, you can do it. Here, it's completely illegal. And that varies from state to state. And, and it also varies such big cities like Houston, you can't keep cobras or any venomous snake over six feet in length. And the rules vary by jurisdiction. So it's, it's interesting. Some of these guys that I met out there, they keep hundreds of snakes and they keep in what they call their private collections. <laughs> and they, they keep venomous animals too, all kinds, and mostly snakes. So the source of this information is Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, that's their website there. Um, and it, all, the, all this stuff is up there. They even have a question and answer up there. I'm gonna stop here with this. I'm, I'm curious if there's any questions on this because this varies state by state. Like California, if you wanna hurt, you gotta buy a fishing license. And I think Arizona considers them a game animal and you got to buy a hunting license. So you need both a fishing and hunting license in Arizona. In Arizona. Yeah. So every state handles it a little differently. And the way they enforce it is obviously a little different. So, um, yeah, in, we, enforce, enforcement is always key because it comes down to the definition of take and how the right. state and or the given officer 
is going to define take. You know, if I if I temporarily, you know, confine a snake on the side of the road to take its picture, have I am I possessing that animal? Have I taken it? So the I think the spirit of the law is is clear as far as keeping folks from doing the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, it varies widely. Yeah. And the other thing I will say is most public officials, their number one priority is to keep keep the people that elected them safe, right? And road cruising in the middle of the night in a lot of places is is not the safest thing in the world to be doing, especially when there's venomous snakes involved. And I do want to say I don't I don't touch those animals. The only the only thing you'll see some photos I took, but um, I have a long handle snake hook and I just pulled it off to the side and took my pictures and let it go. So I don't, I don't handle them and I don't recommend people handle venomous, venomous animals. It's, it's just not a good idea. So. Yeah, the, the, the key for, for laws like is what's the case law? And it's the case law statewide if there's been a decision in an appeals court and then there's the local appeals law the, the, the local uh, case law. And uh, I, I bet especially for road cruising that there've been enough cases that would clarify this. And the only question is how to find out what the case decisions have been. Because that, that's gonna guide your local wildlife officers. Right, that's, that's an excellent point. And I, and I will say, um, even though it's, I'll, I'll show it later in a later slide, it's very desolate out there. There's there's not a lot of people, not a lot of traffic out on a lot of these roads out there. Um, you are being watched. It's an area of the country, the border, the Rio Grande is right there. And it's an area of the country where there's illegal immigration going on and smuggling, drug smuggling. And at no time when I was out there, there were times when I felt very alone and very isolated. But you see these, these border patrol guys, they're all watching you. They're, they're out there. They have night vision. They got drones. They got... They, they crawl up, they, they park up on top of these hills and they use night vision to look for anything going on that's illegal. And, and they're looking for a lot more stuff than just somebody looking for snakes or looking for lizards or something. But they're out there. And one road I drove down where I'm headed toward the Rio Grande. And then on the way back, there's a checkpoint. And um, it's, it's Border Patrol. So if you're coming back, they, they want to verify you're a US citizen and they stop everyone even, you know, two o'clock in the morning or whenever. And I, would, I was coming back several times and, and, you know, they see me with the vest on and they know what I'm doing. And they said, did you find any snakes? Are you a U.S. citizen? Yes, sir. Here's my ID. And did you find any snakes? So, yeah, yeah, I did. So they, they know what you're doing out there. They're not, so it's not, it's not a mystery, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, so I did put together a list. This is not a comprehensive list of the endangered and threatened herps on the Texas list. These are ones that it's absolutely illegal to uh, kill or molest or do any, you know, do anything, you know, to. And there is, I, even though there's not any salamanders out in West Texas, I managed to put a photo in of one. Uh, this is one of the blind salamanders. There's a few. Barton Springs salamander and Austin blind salamander and the Texas blind salamander, they live in caves. They can only be found in one little cave system on the entire planet, these different species. And many of them are being protected and bred and uh, they've locked those areas down. So this is, I'm not sure which one of those this is, but this is one of those, this picture is one of those I found online. Uh, alligator snapping turtle has a has a range in Texas. They're on the list. That one's on the list. Pine snake, scarlet snakes, the reticulated gecko, the Texas horn lizard, like I mentioned earlier, Texas indigo snake. That, that they can only they're actually not found in the Trans Pecos. They're further south, um, way down, way down south in Texas. Uh, smooth green snake, Texas tortoise, timber rattlers are on the list. There's a little black-headed snake, the Houston toad, Mexican tree frog, Chihuahuan mud turtle, Chihuahuan desert liar snake. This is not a comprehensive list. This is just uh, some I picked out that I thought were sort of iconic. And I highlighted four of these 
Can anyone guess why I highlighted four of these? No, these are the same it's in Maryland. Yeah, these these are these actually these four species are also on our list here of threatened or I think they're on the C list. Is that right? The C list, the ones that are most endangered. I found, it interest, I found an interest. I found an interest. Pine is utter nonsense, though. But <laughs> according well, to the, we never had one in the first place. I don't think, but. And this yeah. one's a different species. It's a Louisiana pine snake than the one they claim here that we have here. Um, but I just found it interesting that these same snakes struggle in, di in, in a different part of the country. So I, I highlighted them. Timber rattlesnakes down there have always been known as cane breaks, but they've reclassified them and now they considered, they're all considered the same, the same species. Okay, so this just a little information. I'm not trying to plug for this hotel, but um, I know a guy I went to high school with who's been herping in Texas uh, since he was a teenager, and he pointed me this direction. Um, so this is where I went. I went to Sanderson, Texas, in Terrell County, Terrell County, Texas. Uh, Terrell County is roughly one fifth the size of the entire state of Maryland. The entire population of the county is like 900. 28 people so it's one fifth our size as a state and there's only 900 people there and most of them live in sanderson it's called the county seat do we have county seats here that's where all the government and all the sheriff is and all that for the for the county um yeah, we, and, we have sorry. the same here we, just just about every, every place in the united states Every county has a county seat, but okay. going on, this, this is a great talk. Keep going. Okay. So to give you a perspective, the entire population, the entire county, 900 people. Uh, the nearest grocery store is a Walmart 60 miles away in Fort Stockton, Texas, up the road, up the road from there. Uh, the average high temperature is about 94 degrees year round. Well, it doesn't stay that year round, but the average temp. Average rainfall is just under 15 inches. So you can really see this is a dry, this is a dry environment. We can get 15 inches in a month here, or even less. Um, and this hotel, this motel actually is called the Outback Oasis. It's in Sanderson. It's a herper friendly place to stay. And is run by this couple, Ruth and Roy Engeldorf, who moved out there. Roy is a big herper and he has a whole collection of snakes that he keeps on display at the hotel which includes many of the local species. And I'm pretty sure he has almost every rattlesnake you can find in the state of Texas. So it's a good place to go because they, you know, they're, they're friendly. There's not a lot of places where you could go out and find Mojave rattlesnakes and bring them back into the hotel and they're going to be okay with it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And there were guys doing that when I was there. There were some guys from Baylor out looking for Mojave's for cancer research. So it's kind of nice to know it's there. And they're, they're really friendly folks. He let me photograph some of his, some of his herps that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, when is the best time of day to explore the Trans-Pecos? And this is one of the things that really knocked me out when I got out there. Um, most of the desert species have adopted to be active at night or after a rainfall. And certain seasons, temperatures drop dramatically at night in the desert, which, which encourages a lot of these animals to get out on the road when it's cold at night. Um, and there's no major cities out there at all. The nearest major city is probably San Antonio, I would think. So at night, the skies are just unbelievable when you turn out the lights you turn off the car you look up and it is just it's just full it's like diamonds everywhere you can see galaxies it's just unbelievable amazing and then you turn out the lights you turn out the headlights and your and your flashlights and it is pitch black where you are um but when it gets dark the whole desert just comes alive these animals get it come out they start moving and there's a whole bunch of them not just herbs so that was one of the things that really knocked me out. I regret not doing some photography at night there. I didn't, but I'm definitely gonna do it the next time. <laughs> I'll do it this year. 
All right, so most people don't go out there looking for amphibians or turtles or um, salamanders or anything like that. Most people go out there looking for lizards or snakes, but in interest of you know fairness, this is the Hurt Club. I, I try to include all of them. And there are amphibians in the Trans-Pecos. I intentionally put this desert scene behind this. I'm pretty sure this is a foot toad. Daniel, did I, did I get that right? <laughs> Yeah, couch is spade foot. It's a couch is spade foot. Um, but these these animals have adapted to very little rain and very little water, but there are amphibians out there. They they bury themselves in the desert until the spring rains. They have the rainy season, they call it, in the spring. And they come up and breed, do their whole life cycle in just, just a very short time so they can survive out there. It's really pretty amazing. There's some chirping and barking frogs out there. I didn't get photos of those. And all these animals have evolved specifically to survive in that environment. And mostly, you, you can only see them above ground during and after rains, most of them. There are some water sources out there, and you'll find some around the water sources. Uh, recent droughts, the last few years, it's been very dry out there, and that's made them a lot more scarce. Another one of Daniel's photos is really cool. Really cool shot. So the turtles, believe it or not, there's only two that can be found in the Trans-Pecos, two species. The, the, there's a cooter that lives in the Rio Grande River. Not, a, not the best picture. I found that picture online. I didn't find any of these animals when I was there. But um, they only can be found in the Rio Grande. They have their own species. And then there are box turtles out there. Um, but they're hard to find. My understanding is they're hard to see, hard to find. It's called an ornate box turtle, and, but it's, its range covers a big chunk of Texas and the Southern United States, but they also survive up there as well. And lizards, there are a bunch of lizards out there for sure. Another one of Daniel's photos, um, have geckos, alligator lizards, earless lizards, horned lizards, collared lizards, spiny lizards, and prairie lizards. And you might be thinking, well, what about the, uh, the venomous ones? And what about the Gila monsters? The Gila monsters don't, their range is farther west, so they're not, they're not found out there at all. So I picked three. I couldn't really go through all of those. So I picked three um, of the kind of the iconic ones, the Texas horn lizard, the alligator lizard. They can get pretty big from what I understand, like a foot long or more. But I also understand they're hard to find and they're not common. The horn lizards used to be common and they're harder to find now. Uh, but I did read that they are doing, there's a project in Texas where the zoos got together with Texas Parks and Wildlife and they're breeding horn lizards and they're reintroducing them to certain spots. So there is conservation efforts going on with the horn lizards. Then they also have what's called a Texas banded gecko, which looks like this one on the lower right. Um, it's this is an adult. The, the the juveniles are born and they're more banded, where they're almost exclusively red and yellow bands. You can kind of see them how they faded there on that on that particular shot. I didn't see any of these. I didn't see any of these animals when I was out there. And then this is a collared lizard shot by Daniel. I just had to put it in there. It's just too cool of a shot. Uh, even though I don't think the collared lizards in West Texas are green, I think they're beige. But it's still, it's, it's the same species. Okay, there's, there's this one snake that is kind of the, what do we call it? The holy grail. And it's called a gray banded king snake, Lampropeltis alterna. And all the guys in Texas want to find one of these snakes. Everybody out there goes out there. So this is kind of the crown jewel. They're elusive snakes, but I've heard they're not, they're not uncommon if the conditions are right. They can only be found out in the Trans-Pecos and in parts of Mexico, I believe. There's different colors of them, but the gray, black, and orange ones are the most highly prized. And another kind of an aside out there, the herpers and the herping community, they don't talk, they don't use common names when they talk about animals, they use their scientific names. So they only use the second part of their scientific name. So out there, 
if they're talking about a gray banded king snake, they just say Alterna. If they're talking about a Western Diamondback, they just say Atrox. So they have, and if it's a Transpecos rat snake, they say Subak. They don't. They they use the Latin names out there when they talk about animals for the most part. These are a couple of Roy snakes he let me photograph. The one on the left, you gotta admit, it is a really beautiful snake. Uh, the one on the right is a different color morph, but they're the same, they're the same species. But the, the ones with the bright orange on them are really highly, highly sought after and highly prized. <laughs> Everybody's out there looking for one of these. And they're kind of reclusive snakes. My understanding is they eat lizards primarily, even though they're a king snake. I think they do eat other snakes as well, but they're just they're just not easy to they're just not easy to find. So venomous snakes are the Transpecos. Um, there's a black tail they have black tail rattlesnakes, broad banded copperheads. They were previously called Transpecos copperheads, but now they've been lumped in with just this one species. They have a desert Massasauga. Model rock rattlesnakes, Mojave rattlesnakes, coral snakes, and Western diamondback rattlesnakes out there. A lot of rattlesnakes, a lot of venomous snakes. Um, this is the only one I found. I found one when I was out there, and the pictures aren't the best, but I was had a flashlight in one hand and a camera in the other, if you will. And, uh, Really cool, really cool snake. I'll let, I really love the way their heads look. Uh, and it was fairly docile as I remember. It was pretty timid. I just pulled it off the road and took a couple of shots. Uh, this here is one of Daniel's shots. I'm pretty sure this is a Mojave, even though it has a black tail. Is this, oh, this, this, is a, this is a black tailed rattlesnake. This is a black tail. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the reasons I put it in because I wanted to talk about it. This one, this is Arizona, right? Yeah, it's southeastern Arizona. Yeah. So you can see the black tail in West Texas looks like this. And I thought it might be a black tail, but the, the pattern on it is different. So uh, it could just be the shot angle or whatever, but they look a little different, even though they're the same species in a, in a neighboring state. But a really cool shot. I, I love it. And Western Diamondbacks, these guys are extremely common out there. There's a, I found six of them in one night. Um, they, they breed a lot faster than easy and easier than timber rattlesnakes. So I, I almost want to say they're almost as common out there as garter snakes are here uh, because there's quite a few of them. There's quite a few of them out there. And this shot, I threw this shot in because these two shots, you can't really see this the rattler's coon tail. They're also called coon tail rattlers. And you can't really see it in these shots. So I kind of threw this one in there for, for one reason. This snake was on the road. This is a diamondback. He's on the road. And the daytime temperature that day was about close to 100 degrees. And even after the sun sets, the, the temperatures don't drop that dramatically. It was almost midnight before the temp goes down to like 90. And this snake is out on the road. This is not a deceased snake that got hit by a car. It's flattened out on the road and pulling the heat out of that road. Now, I just thought that was amazing that it was so hot. And yet these animals are out there pulling heat off the road. You can see how it just, it just flattened itself. These are the other venomous ones out there that are out there, the coral snake. They're not, um, they're not easily found. They spend a lot of time underground. Now, I don't know how many of them are out there in the desert because the range, they, they actually call them Texas coral snakes now because the range, most of their range extends over a big chunk of Texas. Um, and like I said earlier, there's a broadband, they have broadband copperheads. I was kind of shocked actually that there were copperheads in the desert and garter snakes in the desert, but there are, uh, cause they're kind of known for being around water. Um, 
The one on the upper right is a model rock, rock rattlesnake. They're small species. I didn't find any, and I think part of it was because I couldn't go up into the park, you know, up into the mountains, which it's easier to find them up there, is my understanding. But they're really, they're small rattlesnakes. They don't get very big. They're only about two feet long, I think, on average. And, um, but they're really cool looking little snakes. And they also have a desert Mossasago. That's not the best picture. Or maybe a prairie rattler. I can't remember. I have to go back to the other side. <laughs> And then the one on the bottom right is, is a Mojave. And you can see that one, it looks a lot like a diamondback, but it has the, the coon tails a little different. The white bands are bigger than the black bands and on diamondback, they're about the same width. But the thing about the Mojaves is like I said earlier, there were guys out there looking for them to study their venom for cancer research because the Mojaves have one of the most toxic venoms of any, any rattlesnake. So if you're gonna get bit by a rattlesnake, don't get bit by that. <laughs> they have neuro, it has a combination neurotoxic and hemotoxic venom. So um, that's not one. Timber rattlesnake as well, They're, they have pretty potent venom. <laughs> So then I put together another list of other snakes out there. This is not a comprehensive list. There's a ton of snakes out there, all different species. Um, Bear's rat snakes, blind snakes, black-headed snakes, bull gopher snakes, coach whips, whip snakes, several types of king snakes, garter snakes, glossy snakes, several types of rat snakes, hognose snakes, hooknose snakes, long nose, liar, Western milk snakes, night snakes, patch nose snakes, ring neck snakes, transpecos rat snake, which is a bit different than most rat snakes, and even water snakes in the Rio Grande. Uh, the ones I highlighted are ones that I have some slides on, separate slides on. This one, transpecos rat snake, is um, the subocularis part of its Latin name is a reference to their eyes. They have huge eyes. You can see them in these photos because they're exclusive night hunters. They, they hunt by starlight. They hunt when it's pitch black. So their eyes are, are very big. And I just think it's an iconic snake. You can only find them out there and in parts of Mexico. There's a similar species, I think, over in Arizona, maybe California. Um, but it just looks like Texas to me. It's got those H's on them. They're really cool snakes. And they are fairly common. If you go to the right places out there, they're not endangered or anything like, uh, like you might think. But I was kind of shocked. I found three of them in one night. And one of them was almost five feet long. And they, they don't get much bigger than that. They're not as big as our rat snakes here in Maryland. These are three other ones. Other snakes I found when I was out there. The very first one I found was a garter snake. And I went, man, I drove 1,500 miles to find a garter snake. But so this one on the lower left, it's actually a different species than we have here. It's called a checkered garter. Um, and I was a little shocked to see one, but there was a water source. And I was walking around this little pond, and there it was, boom. So, uh, and, I, and I like garter snakes, so it was cool. It was kind of funny. That's probably the very first snake species I caught as a kid as well, because I lived in, in not too far from there. And this other snake I found is called a glossy snake. Um, I thought it was a little gopher snake, a juvenile gopher snake or rat snake when I found it. But I had, and I looked it up and when I looked at the photos, I figured out what it was. It also has eyes. You can, can't really see in this photo. Let me see if I can. No, I can't blow up the photo. But its eyes are similar to the other the transpicus rat snake, and that it it hunts at night. So its eyes are all kind of pointed up, and they're large. And this other little snake, I saw it in the road, and it looked white in the road. This very tiny little snake called a Chihuahuan hook nose snake. So they, are, they have big snakes and venomous snakes out there, but they also have these little tiny um, snakes like, like brown snakes that we have here. And then, then they eat spiders, they eat um, scorpions and little bugs in the desert. I, I thought it was a cool looking little snake. It's kind of hard to see, but it does have a little hook on its nose. 
So these guys, the one on the right, this is a, a, a Western milk snake. They have a whole bunch, they had a whole bunch of subspecies that are now been pretty much eliminated. Like they call them New Mexico milk snakes and some other things, but they look a little different depending on where you find them, but they're all called Westerns now. And this was one of uh, Roy's snake, Roy's snakes that he let me photograph. The one on the right, really, really pretty. And the ones on the left are called Splendidas. They call them Splendidas. It's a desert king, and it, it is actually a, di a different species than the ones uh, that we find here and in the Southeast United States. Um, I, I was a little shocked they had their own king snake, but they do. Um, and these, these guys, a lot of people looking for them out there as well. I think they breed them and sell them. Uh, these two, um, I put these two on because I have personal experiences with it. I caught both these snakes as a kid, both these species. The left one is a coach whip. It's closely related to our racers that we have here. Um, you can see why it's called a coach whip because it kind of looks like it's braided, like braided leather or something. And uh, I did see several of these out there, but you don't, they're, they're diurnal, so they don't come out at night. You see them at sunset and sunrise crossing the roads. And sometimes in the middle of the day when they hunt, but they don't hunt in the heat. And uh, when this, I have a story about a coach whip when I was a little boy, when I was like 11 years old, me and my brother caught one in San Antonio. And I didn't realize it until I looked it up for this presentation, but coach whips are one of the top four biggest snakes in North America, native snakes in North America. The record's like eight foot two, so they get really big. And I caught this six foot one when I was a kid with my brother near some railroad tracks. It was up under a breeding pair of them, it was up under a, a bunch of cardboard. And I managed to grab one, not realizing the snake was bigger than me, it was longer than me. And we took it home and it was so big, we couldn't put it in the aquarium we had. So we had this big tin can that was about like a small garbage can that we poked holes in and we put it in. Uh, put it in a can, and my mother, for some reason, she was working at a car dealership. She decided to take the snake to work. I don't know why, but she took the can with the six-foot coach whip to work. And some guy up there, another salesperson or whatever, decided he uh, so she he asked her what's what's that, and that's the snake my boys caught. And he decided he was going to stick his hand in that can and goes, oh, oh, okay. They're not venomous snakes, but a coach whip will, a coach whip will bite you. <laughs> they're, they're like the racers here. They will take a hold of you. And this guy stuck his hand in there and got it bloodied up. Pretty good actually, because this big snake bit him. And my mother thought it was hilarious. But anyway, we, we, let, we, we couldn't keep it, it was too big. So we let the snake go later, but that's my, that's my coach whip story. And, uh, and Roy actually has one with a pink head like this one. It's a really pretty looking snake. And I didn't think they were good in captivity because they tend to be, you know, have a temper. And I asked him about it and he said, oh, I keep this one because it's the only one I ever saw that wouldn't bite me. So um, that's the other Coach Whip story. And I did catch one of these Pachino snakes. I believe they're lizard eaters. I caught one of these as a kid as well. So I kind of wanted to throw a picture of one in there. Striped snakes, they're about medium size. I think they get about three feet long. And there's several different species of them out there in Texas. All right. So more than just hurts. Uh, I did want to include some other stuff in here that's uh, not hurt related because there's some iconic really some really cool animals out here in this desert when like I said when it when it gets dark and you're driving along the whole it just comes alive and there's all kinds of animals out there um, and Texas is one of the states with no state income tax so they rely heavily on hunting fishing industries to bring in revenue and so it's a big deal game hunting is a big deal out there and people pay a lot of money to go to go hunt on, on some of these, they call them leases, where you can pay the owner of this big tracts of land to go hunt. Um, but they are, the state has immense natural resources, but conservation is important in preserving those resources for future generations. So they're working on that as well. 
So I took this shot. It's a pronghorn buck. And there was an area out there. I like this shot because you can see the one tree in the background. And that's kind of how it is. Shade is at a premium. There's not a lot of trees, not big ones like that. And this buck was roaming around this grassland here where there was some water with his harem. And I, I was able to get this shot with a really long lens of just him. Uh, but I thought, wow, are these, are these, did they introduce these or not? They are actually a native species. They would, they've been there since the Spaniards came. But uh, I thought, I thought it was cool. I thought they're cool animals out there. And these, these guys, mule deer, they have different species of deer out there. These are called mule deers. And you can see the one on the left, you probably see why, because they have really big ears. And like I said before, the, the shade is at a premium. So I was driving around Sanderson, a little town one day. And I just saw this little d d doe mule deer just sitting up under the tree in somebody's front yard because it was so hot. So I just had to take a picture of her too. And Roadrunners, Geococcyx californianus, th these animals, there's a bunch of these guys out there. They can, they can get pretty big. I didn't know it, but in looking, looking them up for this presentation, they're actually related to cuckoos. And I didn't know it. And they can fly. They run a lot of the time. They're called red runners, but they do have wings and they can't fly. And they eat lizards. They eat snakes. They eat a number of things, but you'll see a lot of them out there running around. These guys got a really bad stock photo off the internet, but I tried to get pictures of jackrabbits while I was there and I could not. They were just too, they take off too, too fast. I couldn't get close to any of them on the, on, with, with the camera, but I wanted to mention them because they get really big. Dude. Some of them are like as tall as the tire on your car. And, and at night you'd be driving down the road and they'll come run out and they'll actually bang into the side of your car. Um, they, they get big and there's a lot. There's other species of rabbits out there, but they're the ones you see the most. And of course, they've got tarantulas and they've got scorpions. And I was actually flipping some stuff, trying to see if I could find a snake one day and there was a scorpion up under some stuff. So I took a photo of it. There's a lot of them out there. And I didn't, and tarantulas, I took that shot at night. Uh, I did not look up their scientific name because I started and then there's like a thousand different species of tarantula and I'm, I'm never able to figure it out. And scorpions is about the same thing. All right. Questions, comments. What did you think? That was great, Russ. Can you um, unshare so we can all come back together and chat? Yeah. So Russ, did you did you do any herping in route out there, or did you just kind of go straight out there and just start herping Texas? I actually stopped along the way to visit family. I have family in Tennessee. We did a little bit there, a little herping in Tennessee, uh, but no one really kind of knew where to go. Um, this year, I'm going back, and I'm going to spend some time in East Texas. I have relatives there. Uh, and it's a whole different set of animals there, basically. Uh, so I'm going to try to find as many of the big list of species that I, I presented earlier. Because um, in, in East Texas, they got cane brakes, they got timber rattlers, they got cottonmouths, they got, it's very wet there. They got a bunch of frogs and salamanders and, and actually a few alligator snappers, although they're extremely rare now from what I understand. So yeah, I, when I got out there, I really didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. And a lot of people out there wouldn't tell me. So I kind of had to kind of figure it out, watch what they were doing. Because there was a bunch of herpers on that road, those roads out there, even though it was very dry and it was not the best conditions. There was a number of people out there. Gene has his hand up for you. So when you couldn't get into Big Bend National Park, had you already had alternative places to go in mind? 
or you know because you lived there you had some idea where to go or did you really sort of have to puzzle your way through looking at other herpers and yeah i i really kind of wanted to go to big bend most to kind of go up into the mountains because that's where the i think the tallest peak is in texas um i really didn't want to go up there but i had kind of planned to try to do the whole area and then but then by the time i figured out kind of what i was doing i had to come home so this year i'm going to be a lot more focused about where i go there's certain roads that are better than others and and certain areas like Mojave's I didn't find out until after I left I didn't find any of them because I wasn't going far enough west the range is actually just their eastern range just starts out there and it extends all the way to Arizona and across Mexico and New Mexico I believe so if I want to find a Mojave I got to go a little farther west this year you know stuff like that it's... hey Russ, well, Nick had a question Nick wanted to know about the Guadalupe mountains is it similar to Big Ben? The Guadalupe, Guadalupe Park? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Up on, New, on the New Mexico border, Guadalupe Mountains that he's been to and it says that it looks similar to the Trans-Pecos to Big Ben. Do you know anything about I that? I believe it is, I believe it is. I didn't go up there, but uh, I think it's just as good. I think it's just as good. Yeah, Spe Russ. Species may vary a bit because that's further north, I believe. Hey, Russ. My name's Wayne, and uh, I'm, I was born and raised in San Antonio. So I used to take Route 90 out all the time through Hondo, and I still go out there as often as I can. And it's uh, you captured it pretty well. It's a pretty exciting place to go. I've been to Big Bend probably 30 times. And it's a lot different than Guadalupe. Guadalupe is actually a coral reef. And Guadalupe Mountains National Park is the bottom part of the reef that the uh, white, that the uh, Carlsbad Caverns is in. And right. it's right, right there. But we, uh, I took three students there years ago to Big Bend for spring break. And the one boy wanted to see three rattlesnakes. And we saw the black-tailed and the uh, Western Diamondback. And we saw the Mojave over at Studi Butte, which is on the west side of the park, outside of the park, right next to an elementary school. So I would think that that's probably a teacher duty, rattlesnake duty out there. But uh, and not only a lot of, you know, it's a lot of uh, reptiles, but uh, the more birds in Big Bend than, than any other national park. And you've got fossils there. The largest pterodactyl ever found was in the park. So it's a pretty, pretty ex expansive place yeah absolutely uh, this year i want to try to i want to find some more lizards than i did i want to find those geckos um some of the other ones i, I understand that the weather the temperature is important it's like herping here temperature mm -hmm. the weather is critical to, you know so what you're going to find but i think i'm a little more knowledgeable and i've read a few books about different places to go and if you want to find something. We have the Mara Atlas here, which is really helpful. If, if you want to look for a particular species, you can go back and look where they were found five years ago or whenever that was done. But yeah, it's it part of the place I want to go, but I'm definitely going back there this year. So part of the advantage of being, um, you know, part of a, uh, a large herp club and, you know, well, reputation one, um, is when we travel, we can contact the herb societies in those states, um, hook up with like-minded people and get a better idea where to go. Um, and I do have you know, a few names, you know, to share with you and you can touch base with, even if they're not in the exact area where you're going, they'll probably be able to steer you in the right direction. Um, and I know there's a few transplanted Marylanders out there that I've been talking to about doing a talk on the endangered Texas horned lizard and some of the reintroduction programs that they're doing um, to zoos out there. So, yeah, certainly we'll, we'll talk about that, but everybody should keep that in mind if you're traveling. Um, the Herb Society, where you're going, can be a great resource. Um, you know, people are always standoffish about kind of sharing locations, but I think you have a much better chance, um, you know, if, if you're you know, someone in good standing with a herb society to, uh, you know, find a location. Anybody, anybody want to cat? 
<laughs> there was a question about the species of tarantulas, and I, I can't, I'm not sure. Uh, I assume there's quite quite a few. Uh, when I just started looking it up, I, I just saw there was too many for me to try to figure out which one that one was. So I just kind of bagged that idea. So with with uh, so many kinds of uh, scorpions, and if one of the smaller scorpions being pretty venomous, do you take extra care if you're turning over logs or turning over small rocks? You know, do you wear gloves, or is it really such an infrequent thing that that you don't you don't think about it? No, I usually wear gloves and. Mm -hmm. Flipping stuff is there's a lot of people who won't even use their hands to flip. They'll use a potato rake or something or a snake hook mm -hmm. to flip items. And, and that's actually very advisable in the in an area where there's 10 or 11 species of rattlesnakes. You, <laughs> right. you know, when we go we go up to the mountains here to look for the timbers, it's like anytime I'm I talk to anybody, I'm like, just make sure you know where you're putting your hands and your feet. Because mm -hmm. there's not a thousands of them up there but there's copperheads and there's timbers up here and there's rocks everywhere and they could be under one so only yeah, take you, always one. Have, <laughs> you always have to be careful um and be very careful around venomous snakes i mean the little mojaves i heard have a quite a temper and one guy i read online he, he has a post for the area and he says he's even seen a mojave rattlesnake strike straight up at something mm -hmm. so <laughs> The ones, the diamondbacks are actually pretty, they're, they're like timber rattlesnakes. They're very laid back, mm -hmm. but still yep. you got to be really careful. <laughs> you got to be really careful. I don't handle them for that reason. My friend who I went to high school with is her, her for years and he keeps venomous snakes and he keeps, he's had 200 venomous snakes. He's been bitten three times too. So if you handle them, even, the, even pros get bitten, you know, look what mm -hmm. happens to Sherwin, right? So I'm just right now I'm hands off of that. I'll move them with a with a hook and that's that's as close as I'm gonna get. I'll let my limbs that's do good. that, you know. And then I'm not telling other people what to do. I'm just just that's just my rule. I just won't. Because he he did, he came my friend, he came to school, he was out for like a month and he came back to school with all these pictures. Uh, he was bitten by a cottonmouth, which is not. Usually you're not going to die from a cottonmouth bite. They're, they don't have the most potent venom. But that's still not advisable, but he came back to school and showed some really graphic pictures of what they had to do to his arm to save it. So he, wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't in danger of losing his life, but he was in danger of losing his arm. <laughs> uh, and he keeps them, and he's been bitten three times in his life. So I don't want to go there. <laughs> not yet. So I, I have to... I have to say, uh, uh, so my first advisor uh, had been a reptile uh, curator at the Bronx Zoo. And, you know, he taught us how to handle venomous snakes. And I, I have to say that your whole presentation on that was a very balanced, calm way of looking at it. And, you know, it, it, it's very good. That, yeah, you're going to survive, but you might go through a month of hell. Although with the Mojave, that would be a question, especially if you're some distance from medicine, uh, right. uh, whether you're going to survive. Yeah, like I said, the nearest Walmart is 60 miles away. I, I didn't check, mm -hmm. but I probably should have. What's the nearest hospital? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and the treatments they're they're a lot better now. They don't they don't do what they did 40 years ago with sucking the wound and you know they give you they give you antivenin and, and treat it a lot differently now. But it's still it's still not something I want to experience yet. <laughs> I, yeah. I avoid walking in the grasslands where the Mojave are really common. It's not the snake I definitely only view on the road. So mm -hmm. Yeah, not a good snake to mess with. <laughs> no. Well, thank you, Russ, for this. I mean, anybody else have any other questions? I feel like I got to go on a little bit of a vacation, which was nice. And even though I was, I've been at home for over a year, so that was uh, a fantastic little trip. Um, and hope that we can all go uh, with you or go on trips more uh, coming up. Uh, any other questions for Russ? 
Yeah, what was your favorite find of the trip? Sorry? What was your favorite favorite find of the trip? I'm not sure you, if you said during the presentation. <clears throat> probably, probably the black tail. Well, the, the, the diamondbacks too were amazing. Um, I, I, it's funny because I grew up in Texas, but I grew up in East Texas and I never saw a diamondback rattlesnake in the wild until last year. Uh, with Houston is out of, actually out of the range where I spent, to be fair, I wasn't in that part of the state most of the time, but I never saw one. So one of the first ones I saw when in the middle of the night and it was up on a cliff on, a cliff, on the, the road cut. And I, I had kind of like a, just a brief spiritual moment with that snake. And then I was like 20 feet away from it. And I was like, wow. So, but but the black tail was a really cool snake to see too, and the and the tra and the trans pecos rat snakes. Those are there. They, <laughs> they don't stop. They don't bask on the roads. You just see them crossing. That's kind of how I knew there was so many of them out there because I saw like three of them in one night. And they move around. They hunt at night and they move around a lot. They're, they're pretty amazing. So, one of those three. <laughs> I'd love to find one of those king snakes, one of those alternatives, but guys, guys go out there all the time and don't find them. So we'll see. I think there's also a black, uh, a black headed snake out there that's unusually large for that <laughs> type of snake. That's I like similar to the alternate. I believe it's on the endangered list. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not common from what I understand. I found a little, orange snake with the black head and it was, it was called a flat-headed snake. I didn't include it in this presentation. But there's a bunch of bunch of species. And I think either the night snake or the liar snake is on the list as well. There's not a whole lot of them. They're not easily found. So but thanks for your photos, man. Those were awesome. <laughs> and thanks for including them. It's a great presentation. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, just to let you all know, next month is uh, May, and May 12th is the next Herc Club meeting. We have Dr. Karen Lip, um, and she's going to be talking about chytrid, something so much fun, and but important to understand what uh, threats are happening to our uh, herp populations worldwide. So um, I hope that you will join us for that. The link to the sign up to volunteer for World Turtle Day on May 23rd is in the chat. It is also um, in the email that was sent out to you. It is also on the Facebook group. So there's it's so many ways that you can click that to volunteer for May 23rd. Um, and Tom, do you have anything else to say? Uh, don't forget to visit the Herb Club merch store. If you don't have your Herb Club t-shirt or sticker or Herb Club mug, come on, get with the times. Um, the, the link is on the Facebook page. Um, uh, I, I like, the Foss Club has beaten us guys. They, they're members of buying stuff all the time from their, from their Teespring store. So uh, get on there. Money that is... Uh, uh, raised from those items goes towards the club and when we do start having in-person meetings again we can use that for um you know refreshments at the meetings or perhaps an honorarium for a hard to get speaker or something like that but um just a reminder that it's out there and uh yeah thanks everyone thank you russell that was amazing i love uh, i fell in love going out west i was raised on the east coast in new york city and my first time out to arizona i was just floored by wow, there's this much wide open space in this world. <laughs> you just, it's not part of your programming as an East Coast person when you get out there. It's, it's, uh, it's an amazing part of the world. I can't wait to get back out there. So thanks for uh, giving us a little virtual vacation, as Ron said. All right, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, I'll have this up on uh, on YouTube and share it with the rest of the, the club members and you can share it with uh, all your other herping friends too. All right. All Everybody, right. stay safe. We'll hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot, Russ. Right. Good night, Thank you. Talk to you soon, bye-bye.